At 4 p.m. on Sunday afternoons, we have a Zoom gathering in which we uh, gather friends together to discuss the sermon topic of the day until we run out of that uh, conversation, and then it's fair game. Uh, but if you'd like to join us, we'd really welcome you. You can find, it's 4 p.m. Central, and you can find the Zoom address uh, on the YouTube or Facebook post or iTunes, wherever you found this sermon to listen to. So I hope you'll join us for that. No doubt you've been hearing a lot about the debt ceiling this week, as politicians argued about whether the United States would default on bills they've already incurred. You might remember a similar debate in 2013, which resulted in a government shutdown. In that version of this argument, the GOP, in the words of the New York Times, engineered the budget impasse as a way to strip the Affordable Care Act of funding, even as registration for benefits opened on October 1st, or failing that, to win delays in putting the program into place. A very familiar face led that charge, and it's not surprising that Mitch McConnell has also been at the center of the current fiasco. This time, the GOP didn't make a list of demands. Instead, the maneuver appeared to be punishment for Democrats' use of procedural options to pass legislation. McConnell wrote in a letter, Leader Schumer requested and won new powers to repeatedly reuse the fast-track party line process. As a result, Senate Democrats do not need Republican cooperation in any shape or form to do their job. Democrats do not need our consent to set a vote at 51 instead of 60. The debt ceiling has very clearly been politicized, with the GOP seemingly willing to put the whole world's well-being at risk. As one gauge, we saw the stock market drop 5% in September, with the debt ceiling joining a list of investor worries about China, the pandemic, and taxes. Thursday's agreement to raise the debt ceiling by $480 billion effectively postponed a real decision until December 3rd. And investors began adjusting to the new date according to Bloomberg's, uh, Bloomberg's aptly named Debt Ceiling Anxiety Tracker. But the debt ceiling debate also pulls back the curtain again on perhaps the most important reality of American economics. Because the people who would be most injured by US default would not be the wealthy, generally, but the poor, who are more likely to depend on social programming and on timely paychecks. Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen called a potential default disastrous for the American economy, for global uh, financial um, markets, and for millions of families and workers whose financial security would be jeopardized by delayed payments. And this vulnerability is intimately connected with inequality. The United States, for example, leads all wealthy nations in low-wage jobs. Almost 24% of US workers earn wages below two-thirds of the median wage. And it's not a new situation. The Stanford Center on Poverty and Inequality put it succinctly a decade ago. Over the last 30, now 40 years, wage inequality in the United States has increased substantially with the overall level of inequality now approaching the extreme level that prevailed prior to the Great Depression. And these disparities reinforce other oppressive systems, such as the pay gaps and exploitation based in misogyny and also and racism. This is a big deal. All in all, we know, that is, we have the data to conclude that inequality makes life worse for everybody in a society. The bigger the gap, the gap between the rich and the poor, the bigger the problems a society has. Shorter lives, higher infant mortality rates, and poor health both mental and physical, have all been associated with larger gaps in equality. Two important researchers on inequality, Richard Wilkins, Wilkinson and Kate Pickett, collected internationally comparable data from dozens of rich countries to document inequality's impact on social health. And this is what they concluded, quote, the problems in rich countries are not caused by the society not being rich enough or even being too rich 
but by the material differences between people within each society being too big. What matters is where we stand in relation to others in our own society. They wrote, our position in the social hierarchy affects who we see as part of the in-group and part of the out-group, us and them, thus affecting our ability to identify and empathize with other people. The importance of community, social cohesion, and solidarity to human well-being has been demonstrated repeatedly in research, showing how beneficial friendship and involvement in community life are to health. Wilkinson and Pickett emphasize equality comes into the picture as a precondition for getting the other to right. Not only do large inequalities produce problems associated with social differences and the divisive class prejudices that go with them, but they also weaken community life, reduce trust, and increase violence. I hope you recognized the 21st century America in those words. But for anyone familiar with the settings for the stories of Jesus, you also recognize first century Palestine. In fact, Jesus's life and ministry cannot be understood outside of that socioeconomic and political context. So I hope you'll indulge me just a little as I take a closer look at one of my own favorite stories about Jesus, which was our wisdom lesson this morning. It takes place as Jesus is setting out on a journey, and a man runs up and kneels before the itinerant preacher. Good teacher, he asks, what must I do to inherit eternal life? That's the kind of question that makes evangelists drool. But Jesus, as always, gives an unexpected and unsettling reply. And if I might mention, if I did this in evangelism class and back in the day, I would have gotten an F. But this is what Jesus does. He says, why do you call me good? No one is good but God alone. You know the commandments. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness. You shall not defraud. Honor your mother and your father. And the rich man said, or the man said to him, teacher, I've kept all these since my youth. There's a lot to observe in that brief exchange, but I want to try to stay as close to as possible to the topic of inequality. Since we can't separate ethics and economics, I will pause just long enough to acknowledge the big difference between the man and Jesus. The man's insistence that I've kept all these commandments since my youth is an incredibly bold statement. Put it in contrast with Jesus's initial assessment that no one is good but God alone. Those words, to me at least, reflect the complexities of the moral life, trying to cultivate self and social awareness and do the hard work of thinking, speaking, and living ethically. In other words, if you're not aware of your complicity, you're simply not aware. When I teach classes on meditation and other reflective practices, I emphasize usually that it requires a great deal of willingness to encounter what is embarrassing and even shocking in ourselves and our perceptions of the world. You've got to be able to laugh at yourself. You've got to be able to forgive yourself. You've got to be willing to change yourself, as well as your culture and society. Sometimes that means listening to an entire Michael Jackson album that you somehow remembered all the way back from 1982. Sometimes, though, that means coming face to face with your complicity with and easy justifications for participating in unjust systems, our racism, misogyny, ableism, our greed, hatred, and delusion. And when it comes to ethics, if you lean more towards all these I've kept from my youth than no one is good but God alone, you might want to check in with the state of the world and your place in it, how you move through it, because we are living within and participating in all this injustice and oppression that surrounds us. How could it be otherwise? We have to have a willingness to get a little uncomfortable. But acknowledging the complexities of ethical decision-making only made more complex in the centuries since Jesus is a rather unsatisfying response. The unasked question remains, if you know all this, if you've kept the commandments since your youth, why are you here? What doubt is lingering in your mind? Why aren't the easy answers, the superficial rules and sentimental platitudes enough? 
if you know what society expects from you and you've done it, why are you here? And this is where the story becomes upsetting for everyone with a little privilege and power. Jesus, looking at him, loved him and said, you lack one thing. Go, sell what you own, give the money to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. When he heard this, the man was shocked and went away grieving, for he had many possessions. Then Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, how hard it will be for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. I've listened to a lot of people try to wriggle out of this text, especially with the way that church funding has evolved. I mean, just to be honest, pastors, we got to be really careful here, right? The man who's kneeled before Jesus is exactly the type of person the stewardship committee has on their favorite contact <laughs> list, right? A donor who abides by at least a minimum standard of morality and is loaded with cash. But here's the catch. We as readers standing in for the rich man, we know that something is just still off. There's some exasperation, even desperation in his voice, at least when I read it, when the man replies, teacher, I've kept all these since my youth. We know that superficially keeping all those commandments doesn't automatically lead to the full and lasting peace described in the law and the prophets or these days by our psychologists. Jesus' answer, you lack one thing. It hasn't yet been revealed that the man is rich. This is the setup for us to realize that the man's many possessions gave only an illusion of fulfillment. It sounds like a paradox, but you know when we think about it, this is how greed works, right? Even when we achieve what we desire or get what we want, the contentment fades and we quickly move on to the next thing. If you want to notice how often and easily this happens, a good place to start, I think, is paying attention when you eat. How often are you already reaching for the next bite, almost the instant you begin to chew? We're preparing for, anticipating the next forkful the moment the food touches the tongue. That's the nature of grasping, which becomes increasingly devastating when we see it at work at economic injustice and oppression. No longer the next bite, which is pretty harmless, our greed climbs the social ladder and becomes the next deal, the next raise, the next merger, the next sure thing. So fixated by our greed, we may not even notice the harm that we do along the way to ourselves, to others, to the earth. It takes intentional effort and practice to begin relating to ourselves, our experiences, and one another in a different way. That healing and transformation, though, is the heart of this little story. Jesus had a habit of telling people to go or to get up after he healed them. To the leper who said, if you're willing, you can make me clean, Jesus heals him and says, go, show yourself to the priest. To the paralyzed man lowered through a roof to get past a crowd, Jesus heals him and says, get up, take your mat and go home. To the demon-possessed man whose healing ruined a whole herd of pigs, Jesus says, go home to your own people and tell them how much the Lord has done for you. To the woman who touched the hem of Jesus's garment, he says, go in peace and be freed from your suffering. And to the Syrophoenician woman who wouldn't let Jesus off the hook until her daughter was healed, Jesus honored her persistence and her wit saying, for such a reply, you may go. The demon has left your daughter. In the gospel accounts, Jesus's healing ministry is about the wholeness and well-being of both individuals and society. He is facing head on the painful, difficult parts of life that are usually hidden out of sight. Leprosy, disability, mental health, chronic illness, social sh shame, xenophobia, and the like are all profound social issues rather than just individual circumstances. Though easily overlooked, this is also the case when Jesus offers healing to the man who came to kneel before him. Here's that word, go, sell what you own, 
give money to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. To enter Jesus's community is to give up all disparities, to give up all oppression that goes with those disparities. And that includes in the economic sphere. The one thing we lack turns out to be the beloved community, a relationship with ourselves, each other, and the earth that arises out of this radical letting go of greed and embrace of compassion. This liberation is the treasure in heaven, the abundance of living in a community where there are no rich or poor. As Jose Miranda helpfully pointed out, people generally forget that rich and poor are correlative terms. We say that someone is rich in contrast with the rest of the population or with a majority of the population, which is not. Jesus is not against wealth in the absolute sense of the word, but in the relative sense, in the meaning of social contrast. Miranda points out, now what this teaching is saying is that in the kingdom, there cannot be social differences, that the kingdom, whether or not it pleases the conservatives, is a classless society. This is why Jesus says it's difficult for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. As long as we're primarily concerned with grasping out of, after wealth and power, we're willing to prop up our own well-being at the expense of others who are exploited and dehumanized. And so we lock ourselves out of the beloved community. I think this last bit is really essential. It's a, it's a tough thing to wrestle with. Inequalities arise when we become willing to prop up our own well-being at the expense of others. The rich, disappointed man's many possessions was a good test case. A glance at the socioeconomic trends of Jesus' day reveals that the most likely way that the man gained those many possessions was through seizing the properties of small landholders. These farmers were constantly and repeatedly stretched thin by tithes, taxes, tariffs, and other expenses that were assessed against them. It became common to take out loans to survive and use their land as security. They were one bad harvest or one bad drought or one pest away from defaulting on those loans and losing everything. People like the rich men from our story were the ones who handed out the loans and the ones who took advantage of the farmer's misfortune and plunged them into destitution while seizing their land. If we go back to the list of commandments Jesus rattled off at the beginning of the exchange, you might have noticed that Mark, and Matthew and Luke leave this out, but Mark included one that isn't in the Decalogue. Do not defraud. The phrase is also the Greek translation of Deuteronomy 24, 14. You shall not withhold the wages of poor and needy laborers, whether other Israelites or aliens who reside in your land in one of your towns. Jesus is pretty clearly adding an economic context to the commandments that this rich man would probably rather avoid. And Jesus offers him a concrete way out, but it would mean exiting the entire system. When Jesus made it clear that the way to fulfill the command do not defraud, was radical solidarity, the rich man wouldn't budge. You may argue that Jesus is being idealistic here, too idealistic, and that it would never work. But please note that the impracticality lies mainly within human psychology, within human greed. The rich man had a choice, and he chose his many possessions. That inability reveals the rich man's, and by extension, our own unwillingness to honestly grapple with the injustice that is used to accumulate wealth in the first place. William Herzog II, in, in this book, uh, Jesus and the Reign of God, God that I, I really recommend, pointed out that perhaps it has not occurred to the rich ruler that while he's never killed a man face to face, he has most likely degraded peasant farmers to the status of day laborers. And from the time a peasant becomes a day laborer, devoid of the safety net of the village and with nothing left to sell but his animal energy, to the time he dies of maltrition, as a matter of a few years at most. Every time he alienates a peasant family from their land, he has pronounced a death sentence on them. He has destroyed a family, killed its members. 
It may never occur to the rich man that while he has not borne false witness in a court, he has defrauded people of the land. Every time he has blamed his victims for the plight that he and his class have visited upon them, he's bearing false witness against them. It's probably not occurred to the rich man that while he has never mugged anyone on the street to take their money, he has used the system to rob the poor blind. He could not achieve his prominence and wealth except at the expense of others, and he, but he does not see this as stealing. Herzog concludes, that is called getting ahead and climbing the ladder of power and prestige. The story in Mark tells us that the rich man went away shocked and grieving because he didn't want to lose his possessions, or maybe more so, he didn't want to confront the harm his wealth had caused. For any of us with relative wealth and power, we face a similar point of decision. As painful as it is to be honest about it, social disparities, including these extreme wealth gaps, it will always arise out of exploitation. This may be a controversial statement, but I really don't think it should be one. So I'll give the final word back to Wilkinson and Pickett, who reminded us that, quote, what is most exciting about our research is that it shows that reducing inequality would increase the well-being and quality of life for all of us. Far from being inevitable and unstoppable, the deterioration in social well-being and the quality of social relations in society is reversible. They wrote, understanding the effects of inequality means that we suddenly have a policy handle on the well-being of whole societies. Rather than suggesting a particular route or set of policies to narrow income differences, it's probably better to point out there are many different, uh, different ways of reaching the same destination. What matters is the level of inequality you finish up with, not how you get it. I'm with Jesus, Wilkinson, and Pickett on this one. The level of inequality should be as close to zero as we can possibly make it, as imperfectly as we can get there. We need to shrink that as much as possible because disparities make life worse for everyone, including the rich. And since I've leaned on the words of Jesus so much today, I'll end with an appeal especially to those who call themselves followers of Jesus. Take his words seriously. Stop spiritualizing and making excuses. And if you have many possessions, let Jesus' words shock and grieve you until you can learn to let go of greed and live into justice. Go, sell what you own and give money to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven because that's what Jesus meant when he said, come, follow me. Thank you. Thank you for watching our videos. We are entirely dependent on the donations of our listeners and members. We hope that you find this content to be important enough to help us to keep offering these videos to the public at no charge by becoming a regular contributor. Please click on the donate button on our website at www.spfccc.org. Thank you for your support of progressive religious programming.